Um, obviously, for me to be up here preaching, uh, first of all, it's a miracle of God. Um, if you had met me 11 years ago, I'd be lucky to stand up here and put a sentence together that made sense, or that was uh, appropriate, put it that way. Um, because I was a sinner, um, I didn't have Jesus in my life, but you know, just 11 years ago, I, I got Jesus, I got saved, got Jesus into my life, and, and just through continued uh, coming to church, number one, coming to church, and good uh, discipleship leaders in the church who were examples like Pastor and Carol, uh, firstly for their leadership, Michael, who's been a big brother to me for over these 11 years, um, there's Jack and also for Brother Bosco, and uh, just for any, all our other brothers in the church who have been a, a support to me, a help to me, uh, to encourage me and to, to help me to stay saved and to be an example. So, and also more than that is God's Holy Spirit. I mean, I couldn't st stand up here and give a sermon without God's Spirit in me because this me, Rani Davis, this ain't me. But through Jesus, he can use anyone. He can use anyone to, to um, speak into their lives and into their hearts. So I've got a message here today. Um, <laughs> amen, Brother Bosco. Um, I've got a message here today. Um, and firstly, I want to look at um, in this message, I just want to tell you a little story, okay? Um, this is a true story. This is me growing up in New Zealand as a young fella. Uh, this is the year is about 1993. I'm 13 years old, and me, my brother, my oldest brother, because my youngest brother wasn't old enough, uh, my cousins, I think there was two of them, two of my first cousins, and we went on this voyage, uh, we went on a, a canoe voyage in New Zealand uh, on the Whanganui River, which is where I'm from. Uh, the, name of the, the name of this canoe voyage was, it's a canoe trip, it's called Tirahoiwaka in our language, and it basically means to paddle a canoe in a group. Um, so we went on this canoe voyage called the Tirahoiwaka, and it goes from uh, Tomaranui, where Jack's from. Jack Hardy is from Tomaranui in, in, in the central North Island. Uh, where it doesn't, the river doesn't start from there, but we started paddling from Tomaranui, which is Jack Hardy's hometown, and we paddled 224 kilometres all the way from Jack's town to my town to to the, the Whanganui uh, Harbour, that's where I'm from. So it took us two and a half weeks to paddle that 224 kilometres. Um, during this trip um, down this river, a lot of this river is very remote. It's quite almost untouched, I won't say untouched, because the Cuzzy Bros grow their dope in the, in the bush there, but <laughs> it's almost untouched. <laughs> but... Um, Along this river, on the stretch of river that we, we, we paddle on, it's, it's very quiet, very peaceful. There's no roads, um, and it, like I said to you, it's quite, it's uh, very, it's in, the, it's in whoop whoop, as they say in Australia. So, sort of halfway in our trip, we're probably, I don't know, I guess 100 kilometres into our paddle trip, which would have been, I don't know, however long it was, a week and a bit, we got halfway down the river, and, and oh, I'm, I forget to say, there's probably about 200, maybe 150 people on this voyage, um, and we're all travelling in, in canoes. So we had double, double hull canoes, which had two men. Uh, that's what us young guys were on. So we'd have one paddle, uh, steer at the back and one at the front just paddling, and then we'd have uh, six-man canoes and eight-man canoes for the older people. So halfway down this trip, down this river, we get to this place called the Mangapurua Valley. And this valley, in this valley, we went for this little walk up in this bush, and it's like quite rugged and quite thick. And then we come out into this bit of a clearing, and we look down, and we can see this massive bridge. Now, this bridge is a full-on concrete bridge in, in the middle of the sticks. And we went on this bridge and there was probably a hundred of us having our lunch on this bridge and um, I still remember it you know 13 years old standing on this bridge and um, yeah so we're standing on this bridge and I remember standing on this bridge thinking wow this is a like it was a full-on concrete bridge and I'm thinking 
how, the, how did they build this bridge in the middle of nowhere? So anyway, how this bridge came about is during World War I, uh, the New Zealand government offered land in the Mangapurua Valley where this bridge is to return servicemen as a part of a, sold, a soldier resettlement scheme. Uh, this was after the 1917 World War I, and the first pioneer settlers that came back from war uh, started taking up these holdings that the government was releasing to them for free, no cost. Uh, they also gave them uh, government loans. Uh, life was difficult from the start. The land was remote. It was hilly, and it was untamed. If you, knew, if you know New Zealand, especially where I'm from, it's like this. It's not flat. Um, and the settlers had to clear a lot of this land in the dense forest to transform it into their farmland. Despite the obstacles, the returned servicemen were enthusiastic and determined. And at the peak of the settlement, there were 46 farms in the Mangapurua. The shared experience through war and these new challenges created a strong bond for a, a number of the years of, that the community lived there. A wooden, spring uh, sorry, a wooden swing bridge was constructed across the Mangapurua stream uh, in 1990, and this connected the isolated valley with the river boats. Remember, there's no access there, only by the Wanganui River. So the river would bring the goods, and then they'd go up and across the swing bridge and into the Mangapurua Valley. The, they planned to build a new bridge in 1936, and they did. And they built that big, massive concrete bridge. And if, Michael, if you've got that photo, you want to pop that up there? Um, that's, that's the bridge there. It's just like in the middle of nowhere. Um, so by the time construction was finished of this bridge, many of the Mangapurua uh, settlers had abandoned their holdings. They had actually left. The physical labour, economic hardship, uh, had taken its toll on them, on the returned servicemen and their families. Um, serious erosion, if you know New Zealand, man, it's known when they clear, like all that bush you can see, when they started going in and clearing it, because there's no root system to hold it, it just, you get bland slips everywhere. And you, when you go back home, you see it everywhere. Um, so due to all the stuff and just a combination of them not being able to farm this, this land, um, by 1942, there was only three families left in that Mangapurua Valley. Okay, and then the government decided that they weren't going to build any roads because it was just too harsh and too hard. And they basically kicked the last three families off that land in 1944. Uh, those families that left, they left penniless. They left with nothing. Everyone that left that, that settlement left with nothing. Um, so, our scripture today is going to come from John 14, verse 6. So, if we could just pull that picture down for a sec and pop up that scripture there. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I just want to pray just before we start this sermon. Father, I thank you for your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit will minister to hearts that hear this message tonight, that you would anoint the message, and that you would be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I've got three points of a sermon that I want to preach to you today. And just got a bit of water. And the first, the first point I want to bring to you is, has anyone heard of the, the white picket fence? Yeah. yeah. So the white picket fence is used to symbolize the ultimate form of the American dream. Happy family white picket fence at the front of this big modest house with children and pets and a sense of community safety. From the beginning of time, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we are visual creatures. With Eve looking at the fruit on the tree, to us here 6,000 years later with our own personal devices. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasing to the eyes 
and a tree to be desired to make wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. The idea behind the white picket fence symbol is using a visual image to tap into the attention and the imagination of the mind. Studies show that the average consumer span is around eight seconds. That's why a lot of us, when we answer the phone and we hear a foreign accent, we usually hang up before eight seconds. However, it takes the human brain one quarter of a second to process a visual image. People in marketing, they understand this human characteristic. And that's why they will use an image to paint a picture in our minds, to capture our imagination. And before we know it, we're eating Subway or we're drinking the man shake so we can look like an athlete. We live in such a visual society today. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. In the old days, people became successful movie stars and singers through talent and hard work. But all you need to do now, post a few TikTok videos, and the people see like what they see, you can become instantly famous, or even an influencer. Let's look at things like courtship and dating. Even way back in time, visual imagery has pay, played a big part in man's courtship activities. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was at a well one day and this beautiful woman comes down to the water to, to water her sheep. He falls in love with her and offers to work for her father or her, yeah, work for her father for seven years to marry her. Genesis 29, 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Another example is Samson. He goes down to the Philistines who are the enemies of his people, the Jews, and he sees a beautiful Philistine woman and demands that her, his parents get, get her for him as a wife. Judges 14.2 says this, And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines and now get her for me as a wife. Today, we have social media dating sites. People usually post, or people usually have a profile, which they post. They post the best Photoshop picture, of themselves to trigger the human characteristic of visual imagery and some will even go as far as posting someone else's picture to portray themselves. I know there might be some spiritual people who say oh, I just want someone who's full of the Holy Spirit and I don't care what they look like but the rest of us let's be honest most of us tend to lean towards our nature of the visual imagery to help select the suitable mate. Again, back to our illustration of the farmland in the Mangapurua Valley of New Zealand. Now, many of these returned soldiers jumped at this opportunity. They've just come back from World War, and they've jumped at this opportunity to build farms from the government-funded loans. And they may even have had a visual imagery of success large land area ownership, wealth, and comfortability. But it was soon found out to be a lot more hard work and struggle than anticipated. And the families who cut their losses and left within the first two years may have realized that the vision of this opportunity wasn't really living up to the picture that was painted to them in the beginning. It was later realized that the land was too prone to landslides due to the scrub clearing, as we talked about in the beginning. That's due to the terrain of the land. And also, the soil lacked a mineral cobalt, cobalt. So the animals that they had on there, the sheep and the cows, 
were suffering from cobalt deficiency, and basically they were starving to death. But the white picket fence dream is not only limited to Australians. Here in Australia, we have the Australian dream. Two-story house in suburbia, the big SUV parked out the front, the happy couple with their two children and their pet American bulldog. You see these billboards if you drive down the freeway. And they look impressive. You visualise yourself in one of these houses with all the accessories, maybe even a pool. We've all done it at some point in our lives. We've visualised ourselves as a music star, sports star, rich and famous. It's like we're not quite content with where we are. Our second point that I wanted to look at is the facade. When we see a brick house, we think it's solid, well built, and well insulated. Australia is the first country in the world to build a brick veneer or brick facade house in Victoria in the early 1900s. On the outside, it looks like a full brick home, but in reality, the structure of the house is timber frame, which takes all the structural load of the house, and the brick facade takes no structural load at all. In fact, the brick facade is supported by the timber framing. The Collins English Dictionary says this, a facade is an outward appearance which is deliberately false and gives you a wrong impression about someone or something. There are so many examples of the facade in life which we can all relate to. The young girl gets swept off her feet by this charming, courteous, well-mannered, good-looking guy. They get into a serious relationship. She gets pregnant. He begins to become abusive. Their relation becomes volatile, but due to the child, she feels obligated to stay. The young boy, he sees his dad hanging out with his bros. They're drinking, partying, having a good time. They look happy. They look cool, laughing, joking, singing, clowning around. Then dad seems to be out all the time with his mates. Mum and dad are always arguing about money. Mum's always asking family and friends for money. Then one day, they get kicked out of their house. And mum takes the young boy and his siblings to live in a relative's shed. Even in the days of Jesus, they had these religious leaders called Pharisees who would dress in fine robes, pray loudly on street corners in front of everyone, and walk around looking holy in the sight of men. But Jesus could see straight through the facade they were trying to display. And he said this, Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but inside they're full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. You see, the problem with the facade and our natural imagery attribute is that it leads to one of the biggest downfalls of human nature. Temptation. From the beginning of time with Eve in the garden till now with our visual appetite being overfed by all the imagery out there in the world. There's a person behind the facade pulling all the strings 
And that person is Satan. Amen. Satan, Satan's tempting is a bit like a bug zapper. I don't know if you've been in those old um, deli shops, you know, you go in the deli shop and they have this, this thing that looks like a heater with blue lights on it. That's a bug zapper. So Satan's a bit like a bug zapper. The bug's attracted by the pretty lights, flies towards it, and then zap, you're dead. But understand that he is not the bug zapper. He's merely the person who positions the bug zapper and switches it on at the right moment. Satan will only tempt us. He doesn't actually make us sin. I know you've heard the saying, the devil made me do it. But listen to what the Bible says. Genesis 31, 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said to the woman, Is it so that God has said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall, sh you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat it, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. You see in this text, the devil paints a picture to Eve and taps into her visual imagery. She begins to wonder, <clears throat> being like God. The other thing about the devil is that he's opportunistic. He possibly could have been studying Eve, watching her standing in the midst of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, looking at its beautiful, tasty-looking fruit, which Michael reckons is mangoes, <laughs> maybe even sniffing it, but all the while wondering in her imagination what was so sacred about this tree? For Christians, there's also a lesson here for us. Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. Genesis 3 says God walked in the garden. But at this time, Eve was alone, without God, without Adam, who was her peer and her leader, and what we need to understand is that Satan came to her in her isolation. Another thing we need to understand is that in this time of Eve being isolated, God was always there because he is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. But in Eve's world, he wasn't there. And this is the cunningness of the devil is that he can sense when we become isolated from our peers, our leaders, and God. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be sensible and vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. Why would Peter use a lion to describe Satan? When you look at the behavior of a lion, a lion knows when its prey is heading towards isolation. It studies its prey, it studies its behavior, and can tell when its prey is going to be isolated. Very similar to even the garden. Satan studies her, knows that she's the weaker vessel, sees that she's isolated herself and moves in for his opportunity. And this is the danger for us Christians, especially new Christians, like the example of the bridge. The bridge is impressive. Put that bridge straight up there if you can, bro. The bridge is it's impressive. And when we head towards the bridge, we walk on it, we test it. It feels good. In our mind, we have a visual image of success, wealth, happiness that the bridge can bring. 
uh, we find out that this bridge is isolated and it's in the middle of nowhere. And for the Christian, when we become isolated, the devil knows and he will move in for his opportunity. And this is why it's important to be part of a Bible-believing, God-dependent fellowship of people, also known as a church. Remember that saying again, the devil made me do it? Listen to what the Bible says about sin and where it comes from. Just put the, take the image down for a sec, bro. Mark 7, 21 to 23 says this. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things pass out from inside and defile the man. At this point now, we have identified four characteristics about us. Number one, we are visual creatures. Number two, we can easily get caught up with the white picket fence facade. Number three, we are success, susceptible, susceptible sorry, to temptation. And number four, our hearts are full of sinful desires. So right about now, you might be thinking, well, there's no hope for us. So it'll be a good time to listen to the rest of the sermon because there's good news. So moving on to our third point, the true bridge. Like the bridge to nowhere, if you put that image up again, thanks bro. Like the bridge to nowhere, many of us are searching for a way, searching for answers, but we're not really sure of the outcome or where we're headed. We're trying to get somewhere but we're going nowhere. And this is why Jesus came. He came to be a bridge between man and God. You see, our sins are like a deep valley between us and God. A bit like that Mangapudua Valley there. Isaiah 59.2 says this, But your iniquities have, become, have come between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you, from hearing. Like our text at the beginning of this message, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And like our illustration used today, it's been all about finding an easy way or even finding a shortcut. But you see, there's no shortcut or no alternative way to God. And Jesus puts people who try to shortcut their way to heaven or find an alternative route in the same category as a criminal. John 10, 1 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter into the sheepfold by the door, but going up by another way, that one is a thief and a robber. You see, Jesus is plainly showing the way, showing the answer, showing the cure, and showing the way to be saved. John 10, 7-9 says this, Then Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come, came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Again, Jesus describes us as sheep. Sheep always find safety in the flock. 
And this is why it's important for us to, to become part of a fellowship church with good shepherds and leadership. Hebrews 25, 10 verse 25. I've got this vision that I've got here. Okay, I'm going to read that vision. Okay, the vision I've got is the CUV vision. It says this, Hebrews 10, 25. Some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. Matthew 18, 20 says this, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Jesus is the true bridge. He gives us the answers. He gives us the solution. And he is the bridge between us and God. The choice we have to make is simple. Do we choose to find an alternative way to try and avoid judgment and to enter heaven? Or do we choose to go to Jesus through the door and cross the bridge to the eternal kingdom of God in heaven? Right about now, I just want everyone to bow their heads. We're going to end in prayer. And while we're doing that, this is a very important part of any message that's preached. Like we talked about with the bridge. Now there are people, whether people here or people who are watching, there are people who are separated from God. And like we said in these messages, the thing that separates us from God is sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means we are all sinners. And the Bible also says, for the wages of sin is death. That basically means that when you die, in your sin, and you stand before God in judgment, you will be guilty, and you will go to hell. That's basically plain and simple. And these aren't my words, these are, this is what the Bible says. But the good news is the rest of that message, the wages of sin, is death. The good news is that Jesus is the answer and he gives life. If you're here tonight and you know you're on this bridge to nowhere, you're on the wrong bridge, you don't know where you're going, you know that there's separation between you and God. You know that if you stand before God in Judgment Day, which every single one of us will do, you will stand before Him and you know that you're going to be guilty. We've all broken, we've all broken God's laws. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. I don't need to go any further than that. But we all know in our hearts that we're sinners. And if we stand before God in our sin, we will be judged by our sin and we'll be guilty. But remember, there is good news. The good news is that Jesus, he died on the cross. You see, Jesus is perfect without sin. Yet he willingly went to the cross. He gave his life. He laid down his life to pay for our sins. He paid, for the, he paid the death that we deserve. He willingly laid down his life for us. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. See, it has to be a confession of your mouth and of your heart. You have to utter these words, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I want you to come into my life and save me. That's what it is. It's all about choice. Jesus tells us everything that we need to do. It's up to us to make the decision whether we're going to accept him or not. Just like the bridge and just like the sheep going through the gate. If that's you here tonight, do not, and you know that you're separated from God and that if you die tonight, you know you won't be right. If you're here tonight and you 
want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to be forgiven, can I invite you to raise your hand to, to signify that you would like to invite Jesus into your life, that you would like to be born again, that you would like to spend eternity in heaven. Thank you to that hand that just got raised. Would anyone else join this honest hand? Or even at home, if you're at home, if you're watching this video, you know that you're separated from God. You know that you have sin in your life and that if you stand before God, you will be guilty. If that's you, our brothers will put a prayer on the screen there if they haven't already put it there. This is the prayer of repentance, asking Jesus to come into your life. Like we said, confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Pray this prayer. Invite Jesus into your heart. There's another hand. You put your hand up. There's another hand. Another, another hand who wants to give his life to Jesus. You want to give your life to Jesus? We can get someone to pray with you. Would anyone else join this honest heart? If you're here tonight and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, join this honest heart. You might not get this opportunity again. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Even at home, that prayer that came up there. Pray this prayer. If you want to be saved, you want to have Jesus, you want to cross over that bridge, the bridge of sin that we can't cross, can I invite you to allow Jesus to be your Lord and Savior tonight? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Christians, like we said, especially during this time of isolation through COVID and not coming to church, and like we were talking, our brother spoke about earlier in the day with fear. Do not isolate, isolate yourself from Jesus because the devil is watching. Get in fellowship with, if you can't physically fellowship, just get in fellowship, just come to church. Come to church. These altars are open here tonight. At these altars, we use these altars to come to to give, hand over our, our crud to Jesus. We come to this altar even just to recommit, recommit our life to Jesus. That's what these altars are for. These altars here are open. Come down. If you feel like God's spoken to you tonight, come down to these altars. Refill yourself with God's Holy Spirit. We want to get a brother. Nari, do you think you can pray with our young brother here? No? No? Okay, okay, Hummer. Could you come down and pray with our young brother here, please? Hummer's going to come down and pray with you, bro. Just come down and you find somewhere at the altar. He'll pray with you. You want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? <coughs> All right. Okay, you just pray over there with him. Okay, these altars open. If you feel like God's spoken to you tonight, come down. Be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Repent. Get all your stuff out of you and just give it to Jesus. We're going to sing a worship song tonight. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise you. Oh, hallelujah, God. We praise you, Father. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
sing it out. This is my desire. Let's sing it out to our Lord and our Savior. This is my Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to thank everyone here today just for just being faithful. You know, in this time where our leader, our pastor, is not well and not here, and that we can all still come out here and do our part yes. to keep our church and our fellowship going. With all the people, even behind the scenes there, with our, our media and with our worship team. And just with the saints that come, you just remember something there. Every single one of us here is important. We all, the Bible says that God places people as parts in the body as he pleases. We all have a function to play. So if you think that you don't, you don't have importance, God sees you important and you have a part to play. You are of value. So, I, again, I just want to thank you as reminding you um, just to go out and tell people about Jesus, man. There's people that are just basically heading to hell. And as Christians, we're light and we're salt. That means we're, we're the good of the earth. We're the ones keeping people challenged. If we weren't here, we weren't challenging, who knows, the world would just do whatever they want. So go out, be blessed, fellowship, maybe even ring someone who hasn't been coming to church, check up on them. God bless you all. I'm going to ask, brother, can you, Angela, can you close us in prayer tonight, bro? Can you do that for us? Yeah. Thanks, brother. Angela is going to close us in prayer. Thanks, brother. God bless you. Have a good night. And we'll see you on Sunday.